I'm learning from this conference that education is twofold, preparing for, for the unknown and transmitting uh, relevant knowledge from the past to the future. And the single most important question I'm interested in here in this context is how can we increase the learning curve? How can we increase creativity in a society? And what is the evidence for that, the empirical evidence for that on an individual level and on a systemic level? I would like to talk about creativity. So when we're talking about creativity, we're actually not talking about Einstein or Da Vinci, or Rembrandt. We're not talking about having a specific talent, or having fun, or happiness, or success, or wealth. When you're talking about creativity, we're talking about something that happens in each of us. 724, in 7.4 7 billion people throughout the entire life. We're talking about something where we explore the world in a unique and individual way. It's something that had never happened before. You can be a very talented medical doctor or a very talented lawyer, but you are not necessarily creative. You might be just simply reproductive. You know, our current system developed in the 18th century. We had about six disciplines. Now we have over 1,000 disciplines to cope with. If you go into PISA and compare 50 points, just to keep that in mind, we're getting back to that, 50 points difference on a country level means about two years difference in education. And it refers to about 0.6% of economic growth, more or less. And if you're talking about changing the, uh, the educational system towards more creativity, we're talking about a 50-year time span from financing and implementing the system of teaching the teachers and then teaching the students and then looking for the outcome. Right? I think we are currently not tapping into the full potentials of what we have in each of us. And I'm going to refer to the so-called Big Five in science. So what can science tell us about how to unleash the full potentials in each of us? How can science unleash creativity? First finding, Heckman equation, okay? We have robust data. You don't have to, actually, you don't have to make pictures. You can have that. The point is, this is the age and this is the return on investment. The older we get, the return on investment for the society and for each of us is getting lower and lower and lower. The return on investment in the first three to five years is up to one to 10, one to 15 per dollar. And the lower graph shows you just the opposite. We spend most of our money um, in higher education and not in lower education. And if, if in preschooling, we spend 95% of our money on the three to five year old and not on the zero to three year old. If you were smart, we would spend and redistribute that money in a completely different way. Second statement, Haiti findings. Okay, Haiti analyzed 800 meta analysis, 50,000 single studies. 80 million students, okay? That's quite an elephant. Just to answer one question, and the question is, what really works? And he came up with 136 variables. And the point is, what really works is personal and interpersonal skills. They oversteer institutional and socioeconomic skills by factor two. If you look closer to it, institutional, out of the 136 variables, institutional and socioeconomic factors have an effect size of 0.23. Any personal and interpersonal factors have an effect size which is double as high. 
So we're talking about concept mapping, self-evaluation, peer tutoring, feedbacking, metacognitive training, etc., etc. Third statement, the so-called input-output fallacy. Big story. There is empirically and statistically a link between input and output in education systems. So the more you pour in, to some extent, the more you're getting out, right? Here's input, here's output. This is the school, right? But if you look closer to the data, it looks a little bit different. You know, Brazil spends the same amount of money on education in South Korea, but South Korea has 176 points in PISA more than Brazil. The US have the same PISA points than Poland, but they spend triple as much. Finland spends the same than Spain, but has 80 points more than Spain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So about a fourth of the output can be correlated to the input, to the physical input, meaning tablets, tables, teachers, repaired toilets, but three-fourths are not. They depend on something else. And they depend on something what we rather call not the curriculum and the cognitive skills, like if you want to become a doctor or a physicist or a teacher, this is the cognitive part. This is relatively, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but relatively secondary. What is empirically relevant is the non-cognitive skills. They make the difference in creativity. Okay? This is empirically a building block of non-cognitive factors along the line of a kid. You start with emotional attachment, self-awareness, executive functioning, impulse control, self-coherence, blah, 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 all the way up. And they do not correlate with what you're studying. It doesn't matter what you're studying. They correlate to the non, to the extracurricular part of the whole educational system. How can you improve this non-cognitive extracurricular parts that would finally increase creativity or the learning curve. That's called the creativity response. We have abundant, contact me afterwards, we have abundant evidence, for example, that exercise, in-class exercise of yoga or sportive exercise within the class increases memory consolidation prefrontal cortex consolidation, gray matter density. We have robust data if you put a kid, if you put a kid in the classroom and have him sitting still running a mindfulness-based program of two minutes, it increases creativity. It doesn't cost a thing. The same is true for rest and sleep and multisensory learning versus digital learning. And the same is true for social competence and also data on nutrition, what they eat, how they eat, etc., etc. Final, the causal link. You know, the point is, when you do social science, you always look for causalities. And causalities in the social fields are very rare events. In most cases, you have correlations. But if you look in the databases of education, the real clash between societies is not religion or political systems or the culture. It's a society's that educate their people and those who don't. And you find a causal link between the amount of education within the system and, for example, the health outcome. The higher education is, the lower morbidity and mortality is. The higher the education is, the higher the wealth is. If a college degree, you basically earn 15% more. The higher the education, the higher the health. So, a rich mother with poor education has a 50% lower life expectance than a poor mother with a high education. The same is true for happiness or demography. Okay, a non-educated mother has five children 
and an educated one has 1.2. The same is true for ecology and the same is true for our democracy. With a time lag of two decades of heavily investing in the education, we end up with democracy. The take home message is, I think, this, we cannot not learn. And if we look at findings in science, we might rethink the way we do education, okay? And learning isn't education, and learning is not necessarily creativity. And I want you to take home that the cognitive curricular aspects of becoming a, a teacher and the non-cognitive aspects are two different things. And if you consider findings in psychology and lifestyle changes, you, know, you can increase creativity in each of us and in society. Last sentence. Education, the difference between education with or without creativity is with creativity, we start enacting and enabling, we start envisioning new ideas in a unique way. Education without creativity is we became postmen that deliver a letter from A to B and never open the mail. Thank you very much. <laughs>